our speech delivered by Dr. Dang Tae Ang from the Manila Times. Thank you. <clears throat> Talk of uh, miscommunication. I was supposed to be the last speaker in the morning, and lo and behold, I'm the first. <laughs> anyway, my congratulations to the uh, uh, Thomas Up University on its 80th founding anniversary. Professor Dr. Somkit Lert Paitum, Assistant Professor Dr. Anusorn Uno, Deans and Directors from 13 faculties and institutions of Social Sciences and Humanities, Distinguished Speakers, Students and Guests. Good morning. I have accepted your invitation to speak before you today with great trepidation. And as I walk the halls of this revered and proud institution, I was humbled by the thought that it was on these very grounds where the seeds of educational democratization in your country were sown. Thamasat University is the fruition of the dreams and aspirations of the Thai people. On June 27, 1934, the late visionary, patriot, and statesman Pridi Banumyong dared to go against the established norm that education was a divine right reserved only for the rich and the powerful. He worked against the odds and went ahead to establish your great institution, which was originally named the University of Moral and Political Sciences. Its principles and ideals are those that I hold dear in my heart and mind. And oh, by the way, another thing about your university that makes me, one, that makes me feel one with it I too was born on June 27. The father of Thai democracy toiled to tear down the great divide that excluded the poor from getting formal education. He fleshed out the ideals of the Kana Ratsudon principle of democratizing education. The Kana Ratsudon principle empowers the people more particularly the poor and the underprivileged, by providing them knowledge through education. It assigns a task to government that it is vital to full national development, stating, and I quote, the government shall provide education to all. Education is a great equalizer. It opens doors and gives the youth confidence to achieve, to dream dreams, and so it came to pass. The former University of Moral and Political Sciences, now Thamasat University, has become Thailand's premier university. Historically, it has produced Thailand's creme de la creme. Its alumni include a roster of who's who in business and government. It has helped shape people's lives for the better and chart your country's destiny as a democracy. It stands head and shoulders with the region's, if not the world's, best learning institutions. In my book, Thamasat University is another word for excellence in education. I am also in awe of your history of patriotism. It was here on these hallowed grounds Thailand's thought leaders and members of the resistance movement during the Second World War would converge and meet clandestinely. It quickly became the headquarters for Thailand's guerrilla forces against the invading Japanese army. But by strange twist of fate, the same guerrilla headquarters were converted by the invading forces into a sprawling prison camp where innocent civilians and members of the Thai resistance movement were incarcerated, tortured, maimed, or killed. 
they would gladly offer their lives rather than cooperate with the enemy. Thamasat University, therefore, is a symbol of independence, courage, and love of country. But I didn't come here to talk about the history of a great institution. I am to speak before you about the role of media or the press in nation building. But in so doing, I cannot talk about it without having to discuss politics of government and governance, public opinion, and if I may add, public relations, and how each one of them feeds on one another, and how they influence each other, and how together they move public discourse and shape a country's road to either progress or perdition. I will therefore delve on the press or media, politics or government, public relations and public opinion, or the four Ps, and how their combined forces, for good or ill, help define a nation's character and a people's destiny. In the Philippines, the press is clothed with a constitutional guarantee. No law shall be passed abridging the freedom of the press. This constitutional shield, however, may be muted in times of martial law, national calamity, rebellion, war, or when national security so dictates. There is a cyclical relationship between the press, politics, and public opinion. One affects the other, and one reacts to the other. Their relationship can also be categorized as push and pull. It is simply that, as in science, for every action, there is a corresponding reaction. But first, let us talk about the press. The press is synonymous with free speech. Free speech in my country is guaranteed by our Constitution. However, free speech is not a license to libel a person, including public officials. There's a limit to free speech. The press has the power to present specific issues of the day as subject for public discourse. It can focus on topics that it thinks the public should really care about. It has the power to make or unmake leaders or captains of industries. It has the power to change the course of history. Politics or government, on the other hand, can dictate the stories of the day through official statements and announcements that, in its opinion, the public should focus on. Politics communicates through, or to the public through the media. It is generally expected that government issuances are aimed at winning the hearts and minds of the people. It is the duty of the press to scrutinize such issuances by putting the official narratives under a test for accuracy. In 1902, Henry Adams, a progressive economist, wrote, Progressive journalism at its core was committed to breaking the willful secrecy of power by providing fact-filled exposés of institutional corruption and greed. News should be informative and instructive. In writing the news, the writer must exercise balance objectivity and accuracy. As much as possible, both sides, the accuser and the accused, must be presented to better inform the reader. The reporter or writer must avoid substituting his biases and prejudices for facts. Facts, as they say, are sacred. The instrument of the fact was tantamount to discovering light. There is something majestic about a fact. Waxes Mary Sienkiewicz of the Greenwich House Settlement in New York. The last thing the writer should do is to be judgmental or purposely influence his reader by presenting half-truths or half-lies or worse, outright lies. 
a German sociologist, Ferdinand Tonis, stated his own rendition of the press, and I quote, the newspaper had become an unprecedented machinery for the manufacture and marketing of public opinion, a channel through which a particular faction could present its own will as the rational general will. Tonis also contended that the press could shape and control public discourse in ways that surpass even the coercive powers of the state. He wrote, the press is the real instrument or organ of public opinion, weapon and tool in the hands of those who know how to use it and have to use it. It is comparable and in some respects superior to the material power the states possess through their armies, their treasuries, and their bureaucratic civil service. Unlike those, the press is not confined within natural borders, but in its tendencies and potentialities, it is definitely international, thus comparable to the power of a permanent or temporary alliance of states. The function of the news is to provide the readers the cold facts so that they may be informed of the issues at hand while at the same time they get enough space to contemplate all by their lonesome, shorn of the biases and prejudices of the reporter. Tailoring the story to fit the interests of one or the other party or put the other in bad light is not news. It is public relations or propaganda or worse, demolition job. Gabriel Tarde, a sociologist, argued that newspapers have transformed, unified in space, and diversified in time, adding that even those who do not read the papers, but who, talking to those who do, are forced to follow the groove of their borrowed thoughts. One pen suffices to set off a million tongues. By and large, news articles that are published or aired are not news in the strictest sense of the word. The writer simply echoes what the principles or the sources say without challenging their statements for accuracy. As a result, what comes out is neither news nor information. It is PR or propaganda in the guise of news. News is proximity and relevance. The closer you are to the incident, the more newsy the story becomes. And to the degree the incident or statement affects you and the people at large, it becomes a national concern and therefore relevant and deserving of space or coverage. If news is relevance, why do, we need, why do media give too much time and space to stories about movie stars. What is their relevance? Well, their worth lies in entertainment. People love to be entertained. Listening, viewing, reading about the movie stars feed on the individual's fantasy, indulging in escapism. The entertainment stories provide the public feel-good moments that make them briefly forget their woes or problems. In a way, they are transported into a world of fantasy, into a world of make-believe, so different from the true state of their lives. In biblical times, the Romans were provided regular entertainment by their Caesars. Gladiators would perform for the crowd by fighting to the death. The fallen warrior either lives or dies depending on the mood of the mob. Taking a cue from the crowd, the emperor would then put his thumb up or down. A thumbs up gesture spares the life of the loser. A thumbs down kills him. It pleased the Romans that their otherwise dictatorial emperor would respond to their wishes, albeit only for show at the gladiatorial arena. These carnivals would last for days on end. And so the Romans would disperse after each and every circus, went back home happy, and their hunger and other crippling problems of the day banished from their consciousness. For a 
at least for a while. The emperor, in the meantime, retires in the comfort of his chambers, ecstatic and satisfied as well that he had been able to manipulate the mob and did not have to face the people's wrath for his incompetence and self-indulgence. Providing entertainment to the Romans by their emperor must have been the early and crude beginnings of what today is called public relations. To solve pesky problems and to cover up one's incompetence, divert the issue, provide entertainment to the people. And that's exactly what some of our leaders in the Philippines once did. Instead of confronting and solving the challenges that lay ahead of us, they resorted to non tours and entertainment, world-class entertainment. In 1975, former Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos staged a thrilla in Manila, a heavyweight boxing event between boxing legends Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. Several international gatherings were also held in Manila under the auspices of the former First Lady Imelda Marcos. Hollywood stars like George Hamilton, Brooke Shields, to mention just two, graced the opening of our cultural center of the Philippines, where world-renowned pianist, the late Brian Clyburn, performed. The Filipinos were regaled by a series of world-class entertainment shows that outshone those in the highly industrialized countries. For a while there, the Filipinos were gloating in pride. Imagine world-class celebrities coming to the Philippines to perform right before their own eyes, singing hosannas to the Marcoses and the Filipinos. And also for a moment, the real problems of the country were edged out from the people's minds. Hunger, deprivation, high prices, killings and disappearances, squatter problems, lack of school buildings, high tuition fees, joblessness, and dearth of opportunities, among other national concerns, seem to have been completely erased from the people's consciousness. But dedicated journalists persisted in prying open the proverbial can of worms. The true state of the Philippines found its way onto the pages of the opposition papers and in the international press. And soon what followed was a flurry of narratives that depicted the real gloomy state of the Philippines, along with the attendant discourse on graft and corruption in high places of government, unabated killings and disappearances and excesses and caprices of the Marcoses and their cronies. Public relations or PR stories are not news. Neither are they opinion pieces. They are sales pitch or sales talk in the form of news. PR stories can be categorized as an element of marketing, which advances and promotes a product or a person or a cause. PR stories may look innocuous, but make no mistake about it. Press releases are very effective in influencing the unsuspecting public. They could even be sinister. Edward Bernays, one of the most influential pioneers of PR in America, and double nephew of Sigmund Freud, said that PR deals with reality, not images. In his definition, Public relations is about fashioning and projecting credible renditions of the truth itself. PR stories advance and promote special interests both in positive and negative fashions. In the positive, the subject is projected in the best light possible. Every conceivable virtue, no matter how insignificant, is highlighted. Oftentimes, the extent of portraying the client or subject individual as God's gift to mankind. In much the same fashion, negative PR highlights the sins of the target individual, real or imagined. The author also resorts to a black propaganda campaign. He launches a demolition job against his target, employing half-truths or half-lies 
Oftentimes, too, the author of black propaganda stories resorts to outright lies, big lies. The black prop operator obviously subscribes to what Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's chief propagandist during the Second World War, once said, and I quote, if you tell a, a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it, end of quote. It was Gebel who fine-tuned the art of black propaganda. During the period 1939 until the end of the Second World War, he waged a public relations campaign to rally the Germans behind Hitler and his neurotic campaign to banish the Jews from Germany, project a myth of superiority of the Germans as the Aryan race and to invade Europe. Gustav Le Bon, author of the book The Crowd, a study of the popular mind, wrote, and I quote, that crooks have never thirsted after truth, that they demand illusions. To which Sigmund Freud responded, we have pointed that this predominance of life, of fantasy, and of the illusion, born of an unfulfilled wish, is the ruling factor in the psychology of neurosis. What neurotics are guided by is not ordinary objective reality, but psychological reality." End of quote. What then is PR? Surely there is a wide variety of what PR is all about. Edward Bernays writes, PR deals with reality, not images. Public relations, he said, was about fashioning and projecting credible renditions of reality. In his book, PR, A Social History of Spin, Stuart Ewen said, public relations is a positive rendition of the truth. Unfortunately, in the context of contemporary events, PR has been bastardized and is used commonly by the Philippine government and business leaders to conceal the ugly truth by passing off the complete narrative only those aspects of an event that will make them look good in the eyes of their publics. They resort to half-truths or half-lies or even outright lies. Failure to distinguish between legitimate news and PR could be fatal for politicians, public figures, or business leaders, or even for those in the academe. Now, what about politics? How does politics affect the press? And how does the press affect politics? Politics or government and the press have a cyclical relationship. One dines on another, on the other. Government reacts to the press, and the press reacts as well to government. Such is the relationship between the two institutions. In his book, None of the Above, Why Presidents Fail and What Can Be Done About It, Robert Shogan described politics as, and I quote, the purpose of politics is often to express conflicting concerns of the voters. The role of the government is to resolve these concerns equitably. To put it in simplest terms, politics defines what people want. Government decides what they get. For democracy to work, Government must respond to politics. Unfortunately, our government does not respond to the ills that plague our country. So, in the absence of positive actions to address challenges that confront our country, what does our government do? It resorts to public relations in the guise of news. It conceals the truth and releases instead official statements or comments highlighting its achievements without providing the answer to the questions, how did the so-called achievements benefit the people, or how did the so-called achievements change people's lives? The media, on the other hand, dutifully reports and quotes what government's mouthpiece says in, says in press briefings and formal press conferences. Instead of challenging the claims of the spokesperson, the media publish or air the statements and total. 
thus giving it an air of accuracy and authority. By failing to be critical, the press, in effect, fails in its duty to check the facts and therefore could be guilty of disseminating false information. In the world of politics as we know it, and perhaps to some of us, truth is relative. The eminent American philosopher and foremost advocate of pragmatism, William James, held to the conviction that there are no absolute truths, there is no consummate gospel by which people, regardless of their circumstances, may live. He also said that the truth of an idea is not a stagnant property inherent in it. Truth happens to, a, to an idea. It becomes true, is made true by events." End of quote. In his book, Pragmatism, a new name for old ways of thinking, James wrote, truth lives for, a, for the most part of, on, for the most part on a credit system. Our thoughts and beliefs pass so long as nothing challenges them. Just as bank notes pass so long as nobody refuses them. End of quote. And that's exactly what happens when statements and stories from the authorities are published and aired without being challenged by the press for accuracy. People accept bogus statements or outright lies as gospel truth, when in fact the truth lies somewhere in between, or worse, at the other end of the spectrum. In less mature democracies like the Philippines, the government and for that matter, elections are characterized by politics of personality. Candidates are voted into office not for their platform of government or their proven competence and probity, but rather for being popular. And once into office, officials occupy themselves with attaining high popularity ratings and indulging in endless propaganda campaigns. The worst part of it is that our leaders engage in double speak. To quote Geronimo, the Indian chief, whose name is the title of a movie, in a quote, white chief speaks with four tongue, end of quote. Hardly any moment passes without the public being bombarded by gobbledygooks. Almost every story that emanates from our government, for instance, does not inform, much less enlighten the public on relevant issues. On the contrary, what passes off as news is actually propaganda or PR. Instead of informing the public what it does is to condition the minds of the unsuspecting audience to support what could be illegal acts. In 1881, Henry Damarest Lloyd, an editor at the, at the Chicago Tribune, wrote an article in the Atlantic Monthly entitled, The Story of the Great Monopoly, and I quote, In a corrupt world, publicity is the, mo is the great moral disinfectant, end of quote. The press has been largely remiss in its job of being critical. Reporters fail or do not dare challenge the statements by the authorities and their spokesmen and allies. Very little effort, if at all, goes into checking the facts and squeezing more information from government sources. In effect, the reporters simply echo the narratives offered by the spokespersons. This is not news gathering. This is journalistic mediocrity at its best. In this instance, the press cannot escape responsibility for writing or airing official press releases aimed at sanitizing or worse, covering up what could be a commission of a crime by the powers that be. In his doctoral dissertation in 1904, The Crowd and the Public, Robert Ezra Park wrote that so-called public opinion is generally nothing more than, than a naive collective impulse which can be manipulated by catchwords. 
Our political leaders often confuse performance with press briefings, issuing press releases, and public relations initiatives. They are so preoccupied with maintaining their popularity and high acceptance ratings rather than providing the people what they really need, jobs, food, shelter, quality education, affordable health care, among other basic needs of a family. They issue daily news releases and appear on TV talk shows on issues that really or that don't really matter to the ordinary people. Instead of informing the public, they dish out convoluted propaganda. They conflate effective governance with high ratings and public relations. I call that management by press release or management by symbolism. To win attention, Robert Shogan wrote, they have made style a matter of state. On U.S. President John F. Kennedy, Shogun said his emphasis on symbolism and personality distracted attention from the difficult choices that face the nation. Again in the Philippines, what prevails is the so-called politics of personality, where candidates are elected into office not for their platforms or programs of government, but on emotions, popularity, family name, campaign and campaign gimmicks. During election campaign periods, the candidates sing, dance, and go to the extent of making themselves as ridiculous and laughable as professional comedians on stage. The press, when it does its job, should be really critical. The press exists not to trumpet the good deeds of government, or to lie in bed with our public officials. The role of the press is to check government abuses. As such, the press should be suspicious of the acts and pronouncements of elected and appointed officials. It should guard against disinformation or outright lies by public officials. Otherwise, the stories published or aired would be nothing but serve and promote the propaganda goals of the powers that be. And the press would have, in effect, would have abandoned its own duty as the vanguard of truth and keeper of the faith. And when the press abandons its public duty, shenanigans and corruption in government would worsen. Poverty would deepen. Injustice and human rights violations would flourish and our hopes and dreams for our children and our country would be dashed. Upton Sinclair wrote in 1908, and I quote, See, we are just like Rome. Our, legislature, our legislatures are corrupt. Our politicians are unprincipled. Our rich men are ambitious and unscrupulous. Our newspapers have been purchased and gagged. Our colleges have been bribed. Our churches have been cowed. Our masses are sinking into degradation and misery. Our classes are becoming, our ruling classes are becoming wanton and cynical. End of quote. My thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dante, for um, a very insightful, very insightful allusion to the history of this university as an institution of, an institution of democratization. But uh, indeed, the history of this university go hand in hand of the, I mean, goes hand in hand with the development of the socio-political uh, uh, history of this country. And um, and thank you so much for a lengthy detail of how journalism and public relations and press management are interplay and create and shape the society and have an impact on the society. Thank you so much.